By way of introduction, Lawrence Abu Hamdan's broad ranging practice scrutinizes the ways in which sound is interpreted, circumscribed, and leveraged to political ends. His investigations have used what he terms ear witness accounts to expose human rights abuses and have explored the poetics of sound and memory. His research has been used as evidence at the UK Asylum and Immigration Tribunal and as advocacy for organizations such as Amnesty International and Defense for Children International. Born in Amman, Jordan, but brought up in the UK, he received his PhD in 2017 from Goldsmiths College, University of London. His film, Walled Unwalled, which we'll see today, was originally commissioned for the Abraj Group Art Prize and first shown at Art Dubai in 2018. Later that year at Tate Modern and then in the 2019 Venice Biennale, where we actually had the pleasure of working together. Lawrence is the co-winner of the Turner Prize 2019 and was nominated for a related body of work, Ear Witness Inventory, shown at London's Chisholm Hale Gallery. We are lucky enough to have his work both in the Solomon R. Guggenheim collection and in the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection. So a couple of notes before we get started. We will share the link to the film shortly, which is about 20 minutes long, and then we'll be back for a conversation about it afterwards. There'll also be time for audience questions at the end, so please do send through your questions using the Q&A function at the top right of this page. With all that said, Lawrence, welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, um, well, before we launch into the film, um, I wonder if you could briefly uh, introduce your practice more generally to our, our audiences to give a bit of context. Perhaps you could start um, by telling us how you think of yourself as a private ear rather than a private eye. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it started as um, a sort of bad joke, as many things do. Uh, private ear rather than private eye, um, because essentially I do kind of investigations into sound. And um, those are, you know, investigations into social relations around sound, uh, investigations into actual sounds themselves, almost like a kind of forensic examiner of, of, of sound. Um, and I got into all that because, you know, I was, I've always, I came from music, I've always been really fascinated by sound and its effects. And, uh, you know, I started to, um, I did my PhD on the history of this field of, of forensic listening. And through that, I, I started to understand um, a lot of the parameters of this field, the kinds of work that was activated, the history of it. And myself started to get involved um, through some research I had been doing into um, the accent analysis of asylum seekers. Um, and from there, I, 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 uh, uh, I, uh, I continued. And the private ear really referred to two different things, I suppose. Uh, on the one hand, it's a kind of character. You'll see the film, the, the, the role I'm playing in the film you're about to see, that's really the private ear. It's not really Lawrence Abu Hamdan. Um, and, um, you know, that character um, allows me both to um, get involved in, in, in such investigations, but also to produce my own personal reflections upon them. So not only am I working, you know, in this context with this film, you'll, you'll see uh, an extension of some work I did with Amnesty International, but I'm also producing films and artworks and installations that really reflect on and find a language to speak about the experience that I've had going uh, w with these uh, investigations and the people I've met and the stories I've heard. Right, right. Well, I think we're all going to get, you know, much more of an insight to that once we see the film. Perhaps you could introduce it for us before we um, press play. Sure. Yeah, World on World, it's a film I made in 2018. It's um, it's um, directly kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a reflection on um, a uh, investigation I did in uh, 2016 into the, the, the Saidnaya prison, 25 kilometers north of Damascus, uh, Bashar al-Assad regime prison, um, a now infamous prison, uh, thanks to the, the uh, amnesty report um, that uh, I had the real honor of working uh, together with them on. Um, 
And, uh, you know, essentially that prison uh, hosted many people who were blindfolded as they entered and they stayed in the, the cell for the entire duration of their uh, incarceration. So that meant that really their kind of mode of witnessing what was happening there and our way of understanding what was going on inside from those who survived was really based on sound, was really on the sounds they heard and um, specifically how those sounds leaked through the walls. Um, and that what they taught me how they essentially changed my brain you know they they really those people really taught me a, a, a massive amount about human capacities to listen uh, and to uh, remember sound and to recount it and to speak to sound and to think about sound in an architectural way uh, to think about walls not through them being div visual divisions but actually that things that leak um, and that are porous and that uh, create specific kinds of, of, uh, of flows of noises through buildings. Um, and so they really kind of changed the way I thought about uh, the relation between sound and architecture. And um, in order to kind of encapsulate how they changed that, uh, I uh, made this film which um, which tried to sort of expand out from that prison. And, and so, so it's, it's not a film about that investigation, but really about what they taught me about uh, sound and architecture. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's, what I, uh, that's what I'll say for now. And of course, we'll, we'll say more uh, when, when, once you've watched the film. Fantastic. Um, so the way that uh, we're sharing the film is you'll see in the description field just below us, um, you'll find a link there. And um, what we'll do now is Lawrence and I will mute and go dark um, and we'll give you 20 minutes or so, which is how long the film is, to watch it. And then we will reappear um, afterwards for conversations. So please do press the link below us, um, watch the film and come back here uh, once you're done. We'll see you shortly. Enjoy. Right, so I hope you were all able to successfully watch that um, at the link below. Um, I've seen the film a few times now, but it was a real pleasure, pleasure to watch it again. And every time I find myself totally gripped by this narrative arc where you're able to connect things as disparate as a cannabis dealer in the US with a prison in Syria or a Cold War radio pro propaganda. I will, uh, but, you know, I, I watched the film and it all makes sense in the moment. And then afterwards, I was just slightly overwhelmed by this, this web that you're able to weave. Um, could you say a little bit more about all, all of these various references and how you're able to connect the dots? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's, you know, though, though my intention is not to confuse people, your response is exactly kind of what I intended the film to do. It sort of holds you when you're there. You're following each step uh, as they kind of accumulate each passage through these different walls, right, um, that we find ourselves moving between. Um, but at the end, yeah, the, you know, I suppose the idea really is to show that walls are walls because they are both solid and permeable. <laughs> the function of a wall is both to block, but also to filter, to, to allow some things to pass, others to stop. And um, sound makes that very clear, right? You see from the history of the Cold War how sound is really understood as a thing that could break through the uh, Iron Curtain, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and, and expose the truth, as, as that Ronald Reagan uh, clip shows. Or... Um, or, you know, the, so, so in the work, walls are continually being constructed and then dissolved and constructed mm -hmm. and dissolved. So it's really trying to get your head into that kind of paradoxical state in a way. Um, and that's why it sort of has this narrative arc. That's why it moves through these, these different walls as they're being constructed and then, and then uh, deconstructed, destroyed. Um, as, in, as is in the last case. Um, so yeah, I mean, your, your reaction is, is, is really good to hear that um, that's how you sort of watch it. Um, <laughs> the question was, uh, what exactly actually? I forgot. <laughs> well, it was, it was also, um, you know, 
about your research process, how you right. um, find all of these different legal cases or um, mm. forensic research and, and, mm. and you know, to, to bring all of this together. Yes, I suppose, you know, what was, what's interesting for me is, is moving between um, these different series of walls and why I, th I think the first story is so important, the, the story of Kylo Lee, uh, Danny Lee Kylo, sorry, um, mm -hmm. is that it's a kind of classic sovereignty case where you see that, that w the wall and the law are in some kind of strange you know they're also it's a kind of palindrome of each other but they're they're kind of linked right that borders what are borders borders are a kind of uh just a, a place where one jurisdiction begins and another ends right mm -hmm. it's it, it, it's not really you know even a um, a spatial condition it's as as much as it's a legal uh distinction and I wanted to show this kind of interrelation between walls and laws and in this classic context where, in, you know, in a person's home, they are the sort of sovereign to their home. But then technologies allow us to see deeper. And where then is that line? Right. The technologies start to make us ask questions. And the advocate in that case says, well, if you start to speak on a molecular level you know, or a sonic level or anything other than vision, um, uh, we, we no longer know what walls are, right? He says something like that. I, do, I don't know, no longer know what a wall is. So it's just interesting to sort of see these debates play out in the court because the court is really where uh, these lines, these borders get, get kind of established, right? So I wanted to show this kind of, um, this, this sort of, uh, this linkage in a way and, and start there. Um, and um, and that's also because, you know, in a way, the work is really trying to access a certain kind of condition. Like I said before, it's a kind of paradox. In a way, it's, 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 it's a kind of subjectivity. It's a kind of feeling that I think many of us have, even now, like speaking to you on Zoom, right? What connects me in Dubai to you in London is the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also the thing that harvests a lot of information about us, right? That, that it surveys us. So the thing that connects is also the thing that sort of confines in a way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, meet, we think that these things are always in a kind of uh, contest with one another, but actually they are continuous with one another. Like I said before, the wall is both a wall in that it's solid, but it also allows things through, right? And, mm -hmm. and so... It's this kind of paradox that I'm trying to get people into. And those stories, each one of them uh, uh, captures that for me um, in a way that thinks about it spatially through through the architecture of a home um, and then, you know, leaks out to to um, uh, other kinds of geopolitical frontiers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, the, the just the, the amount of construction of of border walls that have that have increased uh, just in the last decade, uh, has been exponential at a time when we're increasingly connected, right? We're increasingly uh, in, a, in a world where those borders seem anachronistic, seem uh, irrelevant somehow. Um, so it's really, it's just interesting to, to, to sort of enter this paradox. And I think it tells us a lot about um, a kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it tells us, you know, if, if we can access it, it, it might help us think about how to negotiate it, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. how to negotiate this kind of, uh, these frontiers. Um, yeah, you how, say to, how, very how to cross them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sorry. you say very poignantly in the film, today we are all wall and no wall at all. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so I think that that really sort of strikes at the heart of it. I mean, where in some senses, uh, technology which looks at um, muons, which are these cosmic particles that, I mean, totally blew my mind. I mean, it sounds like science fiction to me, but through muon radiography, you can actually see through physical walls. Um, well, one example of through thermal um, energy as well. Um, and so in some senses, a wall is a construct that uh, that uh, is, is something that we sort of agree to buy into. Um, and I, and I guess we see that with the result of the the legal the first legal case that he says you know if we don't um, if we let this slide then then walls have no meaning. Exactly. Yeah. What what is a wall's meaning today? I think that's essentially what the work's about. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds a bit 
simple, you know, we can answer it in a simple way. A wall's meaning is so that someone doesn't see me in the bathroom, right? <laughs> but I think when we start to ask questions, you know, and we start to expand that out and also look at it historically, then um, then I think then we can quickly find w what's at stake in that question. Um, and you asked about the research process, and, and I will just elaborate on, on what I said mm -hmm. in the introduction. This all, you know, the way I conceive a wall, the way I got there, you know, to this all wall and no wall at all, like I said before, was really having gone through and interviewed these um, survivors from the, from the Saidnaya prison uh, for Amnesty International. And what we were asked to do was, uh, what I was asked to do was lead a kind of um, sort of sound part of a larger investigation together with forensic architecture at the University of London, um, at Goldsmiths College, a research agency there. And we were asked, I was asked to, um, to, to kind of develop ear witness testimony, you know, to, to, to uh, develop a series of interviews and strategies for interviewing those people that could activate and, and let them sort of recall what they had heard and give more precise language to uh, the kinds of sounds they were exposed to. And as I said before, um, uh, sound was... Uh, um, uh, their main way of, of, of experiencing uh, what had happened because of the darkness, because of the inability to leave the, the, their cells, but also because, um, uh, you know, when guards would enter, they would have to cover their eyes. So a lot of information was, was based on sound. Um, but what I hadn't anticipated going into that was just how much sound would reorganize spatially how they c could conceive of the prison and, and 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 you know it's quite remarkable the the what they went through and how they can come out of that with such kind of precise knowledge precise knowledge about every kind of lock that was heard you know which we could then walk backwards to sort of estimate um, with other information that Amnesty provided about how many people were held inside the prison right based on how many doors were heard opening in a given wing um, sure. But also, um, sound was the way in which they were subject to uh, a kind of violence, right? It's, it's not only their way of witnessing, it was also um, uh, a way of kind of expanding um, uh, the space in which uh, any violent acts uh, spread, right? So that, you know, they would start to describe, as you see, the not uh, some sounds as actually you know sounding like the walls were were collapsing right from the resonant frequencies and then we look into the, the sort of architecture of that prison and find that it's actually an old DDR uh, East German design um, uh, and it's a kind of inverted panopticon right mm -hmm. uh, essentially you know we we think of the panopticon as the all-seeing eye that sees everything well actually this building has a, a kind of column of air in the middle, as I describe in the film, in which sound, rather than seeing everything, sound circulate out in very kind of uh, bizarre, um, in very um, ways in which sort of defy uh, physical proximity, right? A sound that could be actually further, could be heard louder as a kind of resonant frequency in, in one's cell. So sounds bounce through that place in, in ways which were also um, uh, informative, allowed us to create the testimony, also part of the very violence they suffered. And that meant that the kind of testimony I received um, was on the one hand uh, informative, allowed us to create certain kinds of knowledge based on what, what they'd heard, but also um, what was just as kind of voracious or just as uh, truthful was some of the ways that that prison f felt to them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like they described the walls falling down or certain conditions of listening under intense forms of sensory deprivation like hunger or, or darkness um, meant that sounds appeared to them in ways in which they would actually physically not have behaved, you know, should we, you or I listen to those sounds. Mm -hmm. So. It was really important to to sort of access that in a way, um, and so I, I guess after the amnesty report came about, there was so much missing from 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 the kind of the the sort of um, 
just the, the sort of human rights side of that investigation. There was so much more that we could learn from those people and so much I learned from them that I dedicated uh, the next three works uh, to sort of trying to find a language to explain not only um, the conditions they experienced, but also what that place in Syria, not to relocalize it, not to say, okay, isn't it terrible what's happening in that one place? But actually, let it be a resonating chamber that we could all learn from, right? That we could all understand differently our relationship to, to certain kinds of architecture, to expand our understanding of incarceration, not just as it happens to one people in one place, but actually generally, right? Um, and our relationship to walls and what they mean, right? Just through that very intense experience, how we can, uh, um, you know, sort of open out from that and, and not essentially only see those people as, as victims, but uh, people we can really learn something from um, and um, who could really sort of um, allow us to, you know, have, you know, understand them in, in some way as kind of experts, right, as people who mm -hmm. have been through such an intensive procedures of listening that we can actually um, uh, learn from their kind of expertise. Um, and well, to do that, paradoxically, it means leaving that place. It means mm -hmm. testing their ideas through different stories and formats. And so once I'd been through that process, you know, and I'd, then, then I started doing my research, that story of Danny Lee Kylo suddenly means so much more to me, right? And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it, or that story of Oscar Pistorius suddenly means so much more, right? From, from what I've learned from them. And so it was really, a, you know, in, in order for, for me to sort of be, create those reflections and, you know, kind of pun intended, <laughs> um, uh, to create those reflections, I needed to, to sort of open that out, to, to take you on that journey, to, 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 to allow the, 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 the listener and viewer to sort of hear those things move through different walls um, and, and then arrive back finally at that prison to understand where, the, where they originated. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I suppose in a sense, um, you are able to use your art as a platform for the kinds of evidence that aren't necessarily admissible within a court of law, a kind of more personal testimony. Um, we see in other of your works, um, I'm thinking here of um, After SFX, which is in the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection, but um, we see how um, uh, the it, it's so hard to describe a memory of sound that we often describe it in terms of other things. Um, and so I just, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to um, the place of, of art within um, this sort of, you know, it's not often that we see uh, legal cases mm. talked about within artworks. You're bringing a very sort of unusual mix um, to your art practice. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a really fantastic question. And what I would say is um, exactly as you put it. There are things which the law cannot hear. There's things which the media cannot hear. There's things which the news cannot broadcast. And that's not because they um, break certain protocols of fact checking and and um, uh, break certain protocols of um, uh, 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 testimony and, and this kind of thing. It's because they actually, uh, there's no really language within of those forums to speak of them. There's no real place for them to exist, despite their, um, their veracity, their, their, really, their lucidness, their, their way of telling a, a very lucid story. I'll give one example from the, from the prison in Said Naya. I was with Samer, one of the witnesses, and we were trying to uh, uh, find uh, the sound of the main door. Why were we trying to find the sound of the main door? Because if I could understand where, he, from which place, right, in the stereo field, he heard that door, I could place him within of the prison and start to understand if he could corroborate other events that had been witnessed around him, right? So positioning them as listeners within of the prison, within of this kind of three floors and three wings, was really vital in order to understand what they could have heard for, for, for legal and, and uh, advocacy purposes. But what, what happened in that exchange, I didn't expect, right? 
So I'm pursuing him to, to understand where the sound of the door, and to do that we need to understand what the door sounded like to him, how close it was, uh, where it was in the stereo field. Understand? So I'm playing sound effects of, uh, of doors, because describing a door sound to me, as you said, you know, if I have to describe a door, I will say really weird words, like maybe it's sharp or it's bright, right? But I'm not using words that are specific enough. So we had to use sound effects, knowing that they would also be imperfect, but they would get us closer. I started playing the sound of a, of a large slamming metal door. And he's telling me, raise the volume, raise the volume. It's much louder, much louder. So I'm raising the volume. And I'm putting also all the time, you know, the, the, uh, more and more reverb because I, I want to understand, you know, in order every time I raise it, the reverb becomes itself amplified, the the the, the reverberations. Um, and at some point, he stops me, and it, you know, this sound is now like sounding like a, a car crash in Notre Dame Cathedral, right? A huge sound. And he stops me. He says, "That sound is there. That's the exact sound." I said, "That's the door." He said, "No, that's not the door." That's the sound of bread being dropped outside my cell every morning. So I say, you know, I'm just totally astounded by this moment. I'm, I'm actually speechless because I think we're pursuing one track uh, that speaks to a certain kind of experience, right? Um, one that we could grasp. Where were you in relation to the door? And where we land at is this question of bread, right? And so suddenly bread, but bread cannot sound like that, right? It's too massive a sound. Like bread cannot sound like a car crash. Except if you haven't eaten for days, and except if you know from that sound whether or not there is enough bread for everybody, the 30 people in your cell, to eat something, right? The sound, the weight of that sound was so important that the weight became amplified above and all everything else. The sound of that impact of the bread on the ground meant something totally else. And, and, and it totally changed the scale, right? So, so, so how do I speak about that in a law court? I can't, because it, it defy the laws of physics, it defy the laws of kind of, um, uh, kind of linear thinking, it's very lateral, right? And, and there's no real language for that, yet it is one of the most lucid accounts of, of, of that place. Um, so, you know, that was the kind of things I was experiencing, and, 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 and that's why I went on to make these works, because art and the space of art, despite a lot of its failings, right, it's, this is not a kind of heroic uh, um, uh, plea for art, but art, one very good thing about art is its audience is primed to experience abstraction, noise, distortion, um, uh, negative space, light, right? These are all conditions, uh, you know, since Cage and abstract mm -hmm. expressionism and all this stuff, you know, Mark Rothko, we, we've started to understand the significance of um, abstraction, of distortions, of, of uh, that, that things can capture an essence of something without actually being a photographic representation of exactly how they look, right? It's not the passport, biometric passport photo of how far my two eyes are and f from my nose, right? But you right, could have yeah. a portrait of me that looks much better, or that, that captures me much, a painting of me that captures me much better than in my uh, passport photo, right? Uh, a kind of essence, right? And I think, though, it, though it's very difficult to, of course, argue for that as, a, and, 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 uh, because it's a kind of gray area, I would say that's the space of art capacity to 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 capture the truth you know mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to capture and and so i think there was this very interesting point with this project where on the one hand i would you know there was this sort of demands of advocacy and and the the and and the rights of 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 those people and and working with something as amazing as amnesty but at the same time there was this very clear lack you know it, there was this space in which it couldn't manifest uh, what I felt was perhaps one of the most lucid um, uh, 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 accounts of, um, of uh, sorry, so I'm, so I'm getting messages on my <laughs> WhatsApp. I'm now seeing that some people are listening to me. Ah. Um, accounts of, um, uh, of, the, of that place, of that prison. So mm -hmm. essentially, um, uh, essentially, 
that's what's the role of art here. I feel mm-hmm. like art is a, it has its own kind of capacities for truth production. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to mobilize them, specifically through that work and the, and the reflections that I had after the Sydney investigation. Right, right. Mm. No, well, I mean, I'm seeing lots of messages coming through as well. It seems that we've had quite a few questions from our audience. So I'd just like to um, come on to them uh, briefly before we end. Um, so uh, one one of our viewers has um, very interestingly pointed out that the film um, ends as it began. Um, so there's this amazing loop that the, the film creates where you're um, in the final scene, it's 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 almost as if you're about to start uh, on the cycle once more. And they ask if this loop represents the unbreakable cycle of life. Uh, no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, could you say a bit more about? Yeah, where, I, I can. Sure. Where you were going with the looping of it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's a very nice uh, comment, but no, I, that's not where I was going. I was going, you know, exactly like, um, as I said before, the film is really trying to make this case for um, a wall as both a, um, a solid formation and something that completely dissolves, right? And, and that, like I say, the, the kind of making and unmaking of the wall happens, you know, con- continually throughout the, the, the film. Uh, and that and and so it was important to just essentially loop that there, there wasn't really a, a start I mean there is a starting point but it's also designed you know to be shown in art context where you could mm-hmm. enter at any point um, and I wanted to yeah have that feeling of the loop and also you know it's not only with with that the the it, it's the drum sound that comes back in and you know mm-hmm. The rhythm of that drum comes from Jamal's description of the of the resonant frequency in the room. He goes, mm, mm, mm. "Okay, yeah." You know, he was making that rhythm, and so the the drum that that is the beginning of the film comes from that same rhythm and resonates through that. That it's that same kind of resonant frequency that resonates through those sound studios. So, um, you know, there is this sort of the beat comes back um, mm-hmm. in a mm-hmm. way. Uh, from Jamal's kind of uh, mouth back into the the drum, and, and I think that was just an important way for sort of connecting these stories and this sort of making and unmaking of walls, and, and this sort of this loop goes on. Um, we have another question about uh, sure. your decision to use yourself in in the multiple frames, and I think that um, actually brings us on nicely. We d- we haven't spoken about uh, the specific context in which it was recorded. It was filmed at. Uh, the Funk House Broadcasting Studio in East Berlin, which was um, a sort of center for broadcasting Cold War propaganda. Um, And so you see these multiple frames of these different um, recording studios that almost replicate this uh, panopticon architecture Mm. that we were talking about earlier. Maybe you could say a little bit about well yeah, the decision sure. to cast yourself as as the narrator but also um the the frames and the context in which mm. it's shot well also i have to clarify propaganda yeah I, you have to say <laughs> okay it's it was the other side of the cold war not everything was propaganda they also do radio plays right there okay but yeah essentially a kind of center for the production of um, sounds that could leak across the Iron Curtain, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, of which it had counterparts on the uh, to, to the West, right? Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, there's a couple of connections there. I mean, I make the connection, of course, that it's 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 a sort of extremely incredible sonic architecture, right? Those walls that that divide those studios are incredibly isolating, you know, in, in really like sort of mind bending ways. You, you sort of hear it when I close the door to the drum. I mean, there's a guy smacking a drum in the next room and you, I close the door, you don't hear him, right? It's, <laughs> it's quite amazing. And you sort of, but, but, but that, you, you can still see that, right? It happened through those, those spaces. So very kind of isolated. Uh, it's a triptych of, of studios. And so that kind of sonic architecture, though, of course, it's not designed by the same people. Um, I want it as a kind of nod to another kind of DDR, East German sonic architecture or design, which is the prison, which is the prison mm-hmm. that then became an archetype for prisons in Chile and Syria and in, in all over um, uh, a kind of 
non-aligned and uh, you know east-aligned uh, parts of of the of the of the world. Um, and so yeah, that, it, it's a kind of connection to that. Um, uh, but you know, also I, f I found the studio a very important cinematic device because everything could be shot through the glass, so essentially through the wall. So you could hear me as recorded in the microphone, and I was very close to you. But actually, uh, there is this kind of like uh, you know, the, you're, you're actually we're actually never in the same space as the camera. Um, there's always this sort of glass divide. Uh, why I cast myself, as I sort of said at the very beginning, I'm the private ear. It's uh, playing a kind of character. Um, but as I'm talking a lot about, um, I'm also, you know, it, it comes from, there's, there's a couple of answers I could give, and, it, and maybe there's not one clear reason. Um, when I'm talking a lot about the scrutiny of voice and sound, I think it's important that you would scrutinize me first, and you would listen to me, and that I would also be subject to those same kinds of conditions of listening that I'm asking you to enter. Um, that's one reason. Second reason, I'm a huge fan of Spalding Gray and the kind of monologue uh, form. Um, and, um, and that this was a kind of, you know, the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I will leave it there. I think that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that was for me, uh, uh, it's an important uh, theatrical and cinematic device. Great. Yeah. Um, well, we are almost at time, but thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to also thank the Culture Summit team behind the scenes for making all of this possible. Um, please join the Guggenheim for a panel on reckoning with globalism uh, beginning in a moment and uh, later today for an artist talk with Ryan Tabet. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, thank you very much.